Jesus Christ in coming to him by faith, believing his word, acting on his word, so that we do not stumble. He began, let's read what he said in verse 2. He said, they will put you out. Read it with me now. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. <laughs> Do you know that some of the people he was speaking to physically experienced this, even immediately after he left? People like Peter, people like Thomas, all the disciples, people like Mark, Matthew, they all experienced it in the days of Saul, who later became Paul. The Bible says in Acts chapter 8 verse 1, we don't need to turn to it, but the Bible says in Acts chapter 8 verse 1, he said, but now Saul was breathing threats against the church. And then the church became scattered. Look at what he said to them. He said, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you would think that he is offering God service. And when Jesus accosted him in Acts chapter 9, that is Saul now, when Jesus accosted him on the way to Damascus, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then the Bible says, he asked, he said, who art thou, Lord? Who are you, Lord? It simply means he was knowing Jesus for the first time, even though what he thought he was doing was doing service to the same Jesus even before time. He thought he was doing service to God. He said they would think that they are doing God a service. But not only did Peter and the apostles of old experience that, we are experiencing it in our time today. In diverse ways, there are many people persecuting the church. There is physical persecution of the church in many countries around the world. Don't you ever imagine that every country has the freedom to go to church. Every country people have freedom to go to church like this on a Sunday or regularly uh, whenever they go to church in Middle East Christians go to church on Fridays, most parts of the Middle East. Whenever they go to church, it's not that free everywhere. There are many underground churches today in countries like China. There are many underground churches today all over the world that are still being persecuted, physically speaking. And apart from the physical persecution, there is also the emotional persecution. Every kind of junk and filth is talked against the church today. Of course, the church maybe has some blame. But the truth of the matter is that there has never been a time when the church is persecuted like today, where the church is ridiculed like today. I tell you the truth. I want you to understand that we are living in the very words that Jesus said here. He said that many of these people, are with, they would think that they are doing God a service and they will be putting you out. They will be putting you out of the synagogues. The synagogues represent what are the religious establishments. The, the, the uh, uh, political correctness, the systems of the world that have been set up to be acceptable universally. These are the synagogues of today that they are putting Christians out. And the moment you are standing for the truth that is based on the word of God, you are persecuted. Many Christians are persecuted in the workplace today because of their faith. Many people are persecuted in the, work, in the, in the, in the society today, in the places that they should have opportunities to progress in the business world today because of their faith because they don't belong to some sacred order because they refuse to sign up to the norms that people are signing up to signing their souls away to the devil Jesus said they will put you out of those synagogues these synagogues are not churches what he's talking about here are establishments of men that are having a form of godliness that are having a form of acceptability to all but yet they are completely contrary to the will of God we must understand. He said it will happen and if we are living in it, we should understand that it is not because things are accidental, but because they have been prophesied. Verse 3, he said, and these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. They will do it to you because they have no connection with the Father or Jesus Christ. But let's read verse 4 together. He said, but these things, read it with me loud and clear. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. He said, I am giving you this information now that these things, when they come, you just need to remember. And this is all that Christians need to do today. Every time I go through a trial, Every time I go through a persecution, every time I go through a phase of my life where I feel challenged, 
in my, in my workplace, in my business, in the things I do outside church setting, I am reminded of what God had said before, that these things will happen, but you must stay focused. You must keep your focus. Go to verse 32 and verse 33 for me. He said that these things will be like tribulation to you. He said, indeed, the hour is coming. Verse 32, indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, the hour has now come that you will be scattered. Remember I told you in Acts chapter 8 verse 1, the Bible says, and the church was scattered because of the persecution of Saul. He said, you will be scattered, each one to his own, and will leave me alone. He said, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Verse 33. Let's read verse 33 together. Verse 33. He said, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but what? Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The mediator has already won the battle for us. I said the mediator has already won the battle for us. Colossians 2.15 says, having spoiled principalities. I shared that with you some time back. Having spoiled principalities, having made an open spectacle of them, he triumphed over them in it. Hallelujah. He said, be of good cheer. Anytime the pressure is on you and you are feeling, what am I going to do, Lord? This is too much for me to bear. Remember his words. He said, I have spoken them to you that in me you may have peace. Last week we were looking at John chapter 15. He said, abide in me and my words abide in you. Every branch in me that abides in me, he will bear much fruit. In the midst of darkness, they will keep bearing fruit. In the midst of darkness, you will keep bearing fruit. Against every opposition, you will keep advancing. In the name of Jesus, Christians need to understand that the battle is changing. The strategy against the body of Christ today has never been seen in human history. Not even the great apostles of old are facing the kind of persecutions we are facing today. We are attacked in cyberspace. We are attacked physically. We are attacked spiritually. We are attacked emotionally. We are attacked everywhere. But Christians must never lose the focus that the one who said he would never leave us nor forsake us is still very much present. I say he's still very much present. He said we should be of good cheer. We will have tribulation. It's not a negative prophecy. Many churches don't like to preach verses like this again because it discourage, they feel it discourages people. They feel it makes people afraid. But let us read it as it is. We should not be discouraged. We should not be afraid. We should be encouraged that even before we were born, he had already foresaw today and he tells us that when we get to those stages, we will have tribulations. But as soon as he said we will have tribulations, he also commands us to do what? To be of, read it, you are looking at it on the screen, to be of to be of, I want you to shout it, to be of, because if you are of good cheer, you will shout it, you will smile it, you will, you will be happy about it. Hallelujah. Be of good cheer. Never let a day catch you anywhere and somebody is looking at you and say, what is wrong? Even an unbeliever will be looking at believers at times and consoling them that it will be better. <laughs> it should be the other way around. It should be the other way around. You have the word, you have the spirit of God in you, you have the assurance that you should be of good cheer because he has overcome the world. May God continue to grant us victory in the name of Jesus. Before he left, the sorrow that people are feeling today, they felt it. Let's go back to verse 7. John chapter 16, let's go back to verse 7. Before he left, he was looking at them, speaking to them like this. And look at what he said to them. Verse 7. Verse 6, sorry, go back to verse 6. John chapter 7, thank you. He said, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Because I have told you that there will be persecutions, they will put you out of the synagogues, they will persecute you, they will kill you on the name of, uh, for, for service to me, to, to God, that I, I can see sorrow has filled your heart. But look at what he said in the next verse. Verse, verse 7, now verse 7. He said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage. Those things are to your advantage. When Paul came later in the scene, he said, all these persecutions and these perils, they will work together for, for what? For good. You don't know your Bible anymore. He said, for all things work together for, for good. So when there is a slap on this side, and there is a knocking on that side, and there is a pressure from that side. 
Just hold yourself steady because there is something that is working out. <laughs> it's working out. At the end, when it emerges, it is good. I say it is good. I say it is good. And it will continue to be good for you. In the name of Jesus. The problem with us saints today is that we forget these words. So the very first sign of a slight knock, not even a serious matter, we are crying. The next thing, oh, we are gone. Brother, how are you? He say, I'm finished. Why are you finished? <laughs> you are not finished. Because there is breath in you. There is the power of God in you. There is the favor of God upon your life. He said that all these things, he said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, is to your advantage. Because I am going away. It will be painful temporarily, but I'm going away. But he said, when I go away, he said, the helper, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Remember what happened in John chapter 9? We read it before in one of the series. The, in the illuminating power of the, of, of, of the creative God. We said that the, the, man, the man born blind. Remember his story? The Bible says the disciples were saying, Lord, who sinned? Is this man, is it this man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus said, this thing that this man has suffered all these years, my paraphrase, but you can read it, John chapter 9, verse 1 to 4. He said, this thing that this man has suffered all these years is not anything to do with any sin whatsoever. Hallelujah. He said, it is so that the works of God can be displayed, can be glorified in his life. There are certain things that God is helping you and I to go through now and this church to go through now that may look like pain. Somebody will say, That's, what is wrong with that church? What is wrong with those people? What is wrong with that person? Nothing is wrong with you. Nothing is wrong with you. Many times I search myself. I go before the Lord. I say, Lord, search me. Try me. If I'm deceiving myself, tell me. Because I want to be sure that it's nothing to do with me. And every time I get this assurance, he says, son, stay on course. Stay on course. Because at times when we look at things that are happening around us, we are tempted to feel that we have committed one sin or we are under a curse or we, something is wrong. And at times, those things could be the reason. But I assure you as children of God, many, many times, it is none of those things. You have not done anything wrong, but you are going through an agenda of God to bring up the working together for good. When Joseph got his dream, he said to his brothers twice, he said, I see you guys bowing down to me. I see the sun, moon, and stars bowing down to me. What a lovely sight that I saw. And his brothers decided that we will kill you to see what becomes of your dream. Be careful who you share your dream. Be careful. You have heard that many times. Anytime we talk about Joseph, we, this always comes out. Be careful. There are people who will hear your dream and jump up with you. There are people who will hear your dream and decide that they want to kill you from that point. <laughs> so you need to pray to know who and who should hear your dream. I pray God will keep giving you discernment. Amen. God will keep giving us discernment. Amen. In the name of Jesus. He said to them, he said, if I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And that is why we have the helper with us today. He said, and when he has come, in verse 8, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Do we have those on the, on the scriptures? He said, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He said, of sin because, that's verse 10, isn't it? Of sin because, what? I go to my father. Of sin because, sorry, they do not believe in me. Of sin. Say he will convict the world of sin. Say he is convicting the world of sin. Of righteousness. And of judgment. These three things are very important. He said of sin because they do not believe in me. Romans 6.23 says for all have, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. God's mediation to prevent man from dying as a consequence of sin is Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit now comes, convicts the world, the unbelievers, those who are yet to be saved, convicts them of sin and introduces them to Jesus who is knocking at the door of every heart and knocking and waiting for everyone to come. He convicts them of sin. Nobody ever opens to Jesus without being convicted of sin. 
Nobody ever says, Jesus, come into my life. I need you without the first conviction of sin. And so it is very important when we pray for souls, we are praying, Holy Spirit, convict continually the world of sin. Before you go out to minister to a person or to minister a mass like we did yesterday and met people fresh, keep saying, Lord, convict the world of sin. Because the Holy Spirit has come to do just that. He has come to mediate, to bring Jesus Christ, who is the Savior, the only Savior of mankind, and introduce him to man. Verse 10. He said, of righteousness. Verse 10. Of righteousness, because what? I go to my Father, and you will see me no more. Now he's talking to the believers. Those who have now accepted Jesus Christ. They are no more convicted of sin per se. They are now convicted of righteousness. They are convicted of their state of righteousness. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 from verse 20. It says for we are ambassadors for Christ. And we are walking with God and praying that through Christ men will be reconciled to God. And then in verse 21, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. The Bible says and said now therefore he made him. Who knew no sin to become sin for us. So that we can become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So that we can become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The reason why the believers need to be convicted of righteousness all the time. Is to remind them that they are ambassadors for God. And they are the righteousness of God in Christ Many times the devil will come and tell you that you are no more righteous because you did A, you did B, you said C, you looked at F, you did Y. And believers will lose hope. How many people got born again 10 times those days? How many people? I, I got born again. Many, I, don't, I can't even remember the number of times. Until God showed me the very first time I got born again was good enough. <laughs> Every time they say, come out, I'm out there. Because I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> they say, if you are here, you want to give your life to Christ. Ah, we saw you last week. I'm here again. <laughs> I'm here again. I don't want to go to hell. Until understanding came. <laughs> Some of us got born again 20 times. Until God said, okay, my son, I, I, have, rec I have registered you in gold. <laughs> Hallelujah. But the part of the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of righteousness. Look at your neighbor for me. Say, as long as you are born again and you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, continually you are righteous. Don't let anything ever tell you that you are unrighteous anymore. Never. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. The only thing that makes a person unrighteous is if they say they no longer accept the lordship of Christ, then so be it. But as long as you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Write it down, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He said, now we are the righteousness of God in Christ. And then he convicts the world of judgment, verse 11, because the ruler of this world is judged, verse 11. He convicts the world of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Who is the ruler of this world? 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 tells us that he is the God of this world, the one who has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. He rules with, with fearsome power. He convicts and, and convinces many that he is in charge of this world. He makes it difficult for many people to come to the saving knowledge of Christ today because he torments them and confuses them with the problems of this world. The Bible calls him the ruler of this world. The Bible calls him the prince of darkness. His name is Satan. Jesus calls him the thief. John 10.10. 10. He said all he has come to do is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But thank God, the mediator, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. He said, but I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Everything that the devil does, there is the mediation power of Christ that counters it. When he brings sickness, the Bible says, Jesus became our health. And by his stripes, we are 
healed. When he brings sadness, he said, in me, it, your joy will be full. When he brings disturbance and turmoil in life, he said, in me, you will have peace. Not the type that the world gives. He said, I leave my kind of peace with you. Everything that the wicked one has come to do has been judged by God, countered by God, mediated by Christ, and victory continues to be our portion. In the name of Jesus. Never let any situation of life catch you again. The mediator is waiting. These days, he is not with us physically like he was in the days of old with the disciples of old. He is now sat at the right hand of God the Father. And many times we have seen in scripture that he stands up to defend the elect. When he was sat at the right hand of God the Father and they were persecuting the man called Stephen in Acts chapter 7, a time came and Stephen said, I see the Son of God standing at the right hand of the throne of God. Many, many times when you are in those situations where it looks as if you are all by yourself and there is no hope, he stands up on your behalf. I say he stands up on your behalf and he begins to intercede for the Father on your behalf and everything that he is saying concerning you will give you victory over such temporal situations in the name of Jesus. In verse 12 he said, I still have many things to say to you but you cannot bear them now. However, verse 13, however when the spirit, he the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you and is he here with us today? I say, is the Holy Spirit here with us today? He said he will guide you into all truth. I say he will guide you into all truth. He said he will not speak of his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you what? Things to come. This is the one I like. He will tell you things to come. When you live on the platform of knowing the things to come, life works easier for you. When you live in the realm of knowing the things to come, how beautiful is it to know the people who will walk against you on a daily basis before you go to the office? Because you can't pray against them. They are there, that is their work, to walk against you. <laughs> that is part of their salary. They pay them a bonus for that, you don't know. <laughs> Just joking. But the truth is that they, they, they are always there, everywhere. But when the Holy Spirit shows you things to come, because many times people think things to come is just, oh, one day I will have that big mansion and I will have that big house and that big car. Those beautiful things, those are what people want to see to come. There are times he will show you some things to come that are not the things that you wish will come. <laughs> but he will show you so that you can be prepared. I told you in the year 2015 when I had that dream, when somebody, I took people somewhere and suddenly people were trying to, somebody just brought out a gun. And he said, well, give me the keys of the car. I said, I don't have these keys to give you. God, give them to me. He said, give me the keys. He said, we will shoot you now. I said, you can't shoot me in the name of Jesus. Before I finish saying what I said, I heard the gunshot twice. Pow, pow, with smoke coming out of the nozzle of the gun. And I stood there like that. Nothing came out. No bullet touched me. Nothing whatsoever, despite the sound and the, the, the smoke that came out. Meaning that the shots were fired, but whatever happened, maybe angels ate them up, I don't know, but nothing touched my body. And when they saw what happened, they dropped the gun and left, the two of them. And I woke up, and God began to show me and prepare me for things. And so many things have been happening that every time I remember that dream, I know it was not an ordinary dream, but the Holy Spirit is showing me things to come. Some beautiful pictures when I saw the images of children gathered in our church setting where we had many classrooms. Children coming to church service with school uniforms. Like they were in uniforms. Coming to church, not going to school. I said, Lord, this is good. That was shown to me almost six years ago. Things to come. They keep you fueled. They keep you confident. They keep you riding high. When you see things to come, I pray the Holy Spirit will continue to show you things to come. In the name of Jesus. If you see today, it is good. But if you can see tomorrow, you are stronger. You don't need any clairvoyance. You don't need any palm reader. You don't need any familiar spirit. You don't need any of those things. You don't need anyone who will put devil in your hand in the name of telling you what is to come. Those of you that read stars, if you are here, you read star. Don't read any star. Read the bright and morning star. His name is Jesus Christ. Take the Bible every day. Let the Holy Spirit show you things to come. Before I used to go about saying, I'm cancer, I'm cancer, I'm cancer, many years ago, because I was born in July. 
Then God said, you want cancer? <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> I said, no. I said, but that's what everybody said. They, they said they are Pisian, they are Leo, they are this. I said, I, I say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm not, I, don't, I have nothing. I reject this cancer. <laughs> I reject this cancer in Jesus' name. Oh, look at all the beautiful names, if at all, they gave to all the other ones. Then they reach my own. They say cancer. I mean, I say cancer, cancer. <laughs> Please, don't, don't follow those kind of things at all. Some people say, but pastor, I, sometimes when I read it, exactly what I see, that's the devil showing you things. <laughs> that's the devil showing you things. Anything that is not from this world is the devil showing you. You need to go to the world. Let the Holy Spirit show you things to come. And I pray God will continue to confirm his word in your life. In the name of Jesus. We quickly touch John chapter 17. The very first few verses of John 17 reveals to us that Jesus continues to pray for us. Verse 1, this is the ultimate goal of his mediation for us to enjoy eternal life. John 17, John 17 verse 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Verse 2, and you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Say with me, Lord, I thank you for eternal life now this is verse 3 he say verse 3 now he said and this is eternal life that they may know you the only one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent this is eternal life eternal life always wants you to know more about God it's not just a life that assures you that one day you will be singing high praises of holy 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 to God in heaven that is part of it is good. Not just that you will go and inhabit those mansions. That is part of it is good. But the key thing is that right while you are here on earth, you will be having a deep desire for Jesus Christ every day. You will be having a true passion for God every day. He said, this is eternal life. This is eternal life. The word no there means that they may fellowship with you. It is like the same no that was used in the time of Adam knowing his wife. Intimacy, fellowship, deepest form of Koinonia, fellowship, coming together. He said, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, they may relate with you, they may be in you, the only one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus, our faithful high priest and mediator, is always praying for us. Let's go down to verse 20 in John 17. He's always praying for us. He said, I do not pray for this alone. Talking about the people he was looking at physically at that time. He said, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Say, that includes me. Say, that includes me. He said, I do not pray for these alone. I'm not praying only for Peter, James, John, Andrew, all these ones alone. He said, I am praying. If you read the whole of John chapter 17, which I encourage you to read to get the fullness of this message, the whole of John 16 and 17. He said, in John chapter 17, he listed a long prayer. He made a long prayer for us to be one together and to be with God, to be in, in him as he is in the Father and so on. And then he said, I do not pray for these ones that I'm looking at alone, but also for those. So when people make doctrines out of what has existed and what does no longer apply, we need to read the Bible very well. He said, but also for those who will believe in me. We are those who have been forecast to believe in him. And we have believed in him. He said he has prayed for us. What is the prayer? Verse 21. He said that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. Hallelujah. He said, and the glory which you gave me, verse 22. The glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one. Just as we are one. That they may be one. They may be one. The theory that is trying to make the body of Christ splinter and make people have this Holy Ghost and this independent spirit is of the devil. The independent spirit is not what Jesus prayed for. What Jesus prayed for is a unity of the body. The intra and inter fellowship of the communion of saints within a church assembly and an inter relationship with other assemblies who name the name of the Lord. This is the body of Christ. In verse 23, he said, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. The perfection we are waiting for is on the platform of our submissiveness to the oneness he is praying for. He said, I'm praying for them that they be one. May we continue to be one. Amen. 
the power of one is the biggest threat to the devil. This is why he can do anything possible to scatter. He can do anything possible to make impossible the power of one. But we will keep overcoming him. I say we will keep overcoming him. This is why as I bring this to a close, we must now continue to leverage the power God makes to us, makes available to us through the oneness in Zion. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 22 tells us that there is a oneness, a realm of oneness in Zion that we must continue to access. He said, but you, verse 12, he said, but you have come to Mount Zion. Hebrews chapter 22, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, thank you. He said, but you have come to Zion and to the city of the living God, the what? Heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. The heavenly Jerusalem. These places we need to understand. God has brought us by his mighty hand to a place of fellowship together. We must not make light of it. We do not just gather on a Sunday because we don't have work to do. Or because it is a routine to be here. Every time we gather physically and together in the places we gather. We come to a place called Mount Zion. Psalm 48 describes that place. He says it is a great city. It is the city of the great God. He said it is called Mount Zion, the city of the living God. Psalm 48 verse 1 and verse 2. He said great is the Lord in that place. The greatness of God is manifested. The mediation power of God is manifested in Zion. Don't come to church at any time without an expectation for a touch of that power. Never come to church without an expectation of an experience of the heavenly realm. Because the Bible says it is the heavenly Jerusalem. And there are innumerable company of angels there. Part of what the mediation power of God does is to release, to release the angels, to dispatch angels on assignment to us every time. Psalm 91 says he gives us angels charge over us to guide us lest we bash our feet against the stone. He said in verse 13, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. This is who we are. We have come to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. To God who is the judge of all. The church is God's entity. Matthew chapter 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. Verse 16b, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Christians should understand that whilst we are given the opportunity to walk with God, the builder is God. The Bible says every house is built by some man, but God himself is the builder of them all. Jesus is building his church. I say Jesus is building his church. And I want to encourage you to be a co-laborer with him so that as he is building and advancing, your life will also be built and advanced in the name of Jesus. He said, we have come to him who is God the judge. I told you about the judge in, in John 16, 11, when the Holy Spirit says he will come and he will judge the world. He will convict the world of judgment. So I won't go into that again. And to the spirits of just men made perfect. The spirits of just men made perfect. Every time we come, part of what mediates for us, you see, we need to understand every time we gather, the Bible says in Hebrews 12.1 that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Every time we gather, the spirits of just men like Elijah, this is made perfect. Not the Elijah, the fearful man, but the Elijah, the fire caller. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Think of everything they did in their just state. Then you have it present here. Elijah, the fire drawer. He is here with us. His spirit is here. David the king, not David the adulterer, not David the murderer, David the warrior, David the singer, he's here. David the prophet, he's here. His spirit is here. Abraham the great, Abraham the man of faith, is here. What are those spirits meant to do? They are meant to cheer us on. They are meant to help us. The Bible says when we are surrounded by so great cloud of witnesses, let us run the race. Hebrews 12, 1 and verse 2. He said, let us run the race. Let us run the race. Verse 14, let's read verse 14 together as we bring this close. Sorry, verse 24 together, verse 24, the next verse. 
He said, who? To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. And he will continue to give us the dividends of the new covenant. In the name of Jesus. The new covenant is a covenant of victory in Christ. It's a covenant of honor in Christ. It's a covenant of dignity in Christ. It's a covenant of eternal life that starts now and lives forever. It is a covenant of peace. It is a covenant of righteousness. It is a covenant of joy. This new covenant is a covenant of divine health. This new covenant is a covenant of divine protection. This new covenant is a, is a covenant of divine presence perpetually. And all the days of your life, the mediator, the man Jesus Christ, will continue to grant you access to it in the name of Jesus. Rise to your feet and let us begin to celebrate. Well, well.